Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us at this, our fifth lecture of our very special 50th anniversary inaugural lecture series. I'm Professor Ian Fribbens, Executive Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences here at the OU. And of course, I'm very proud to be hosting one of the university's 50th anniversary celebration events, which showcase our teaching, our research, and our knowledge exchange. Each year, the Vice Chancellor invites newly appointed and promoted professors to give an inaugural lecture. Over the course of a year, our inaugural lecture series provides an opportunity to celebrate academic excellence with each lecture representing a significant milestone in an academic's career. This evening, we will hear from my colleague and friend, Joe Phoenix, Professor of Criminology, on the topic of youth crime and justice, does age matter? In which Joe will challenge us to think about what a just response is to youth crime. So it's particularly apt for her to deliver her inaugural lecture during our 50th anniversary year, given that the, uh, the heart of the OU's mission is its commitment to social justice. And now it's time to introduce Jo herself. Jo joined the Open University as Professor of Criminology in 2016. Oops, I think that might be me. I'll move my notes. Her main research interest is the link between social and criminal justice for young people and women. Jo writes about policy and practice reform to youth justice, child sexual exploitation, and prostitution. More recently, she's become interested in working in issues of, on issues of justice in relation to sexualities. She's the author and editor of several books on sex and prostitution, and her youth justice research has been published in multiple articles and book chapters. Over the years, Jo has taught a very wide range of subjects, ranging from the history of crime and punishment right through to youth justice and feminist criminology. She currently chairs our popular Level 2 module, Understanding Criminological Theory, and says that she particularly enjoys the challenges of teaching complex conceptual and theoretical issues to students. But Jo actually began her association with the Open University as one of our tutors, or associate lecturers as we call them, way back in 1995. She also taught, or maybe the word is experienced, OU summer schools. In fact, Jo is a living embodiment of the, both the spirit and the mission of the OU. She left school at Texas, in, for, in Texas at 16 with no qualifications whatsoever and returned to the UK with just her passport and a small suitcase and made her way through part-time study in further education into university, courtesy of what was then famously called, if you're old enough to remember, supplementary benefit. In her spare time, Jo's ridden motorbikes, done powerlifting, and says she's danced all night to underground electronic dance music. But Jo describes the OU as her love match university, and consequently turned down the chance of doing an inaugural at both Durham and Leicester, until she made it back here to the OU, her spiritual home, in a full-time capacity in 2016. Over the course of her outstanding 20 years as an academic, she's been awarded two prizes. The John Willis Award at Bath University in recognition for her outstanding accomplishment in research, combined with her contributions to teaching and students' pastoral care. And in 2010, her edited book, Sex for Sale, was a finalist in the Erotic Awards, now called the Sexual Freedom Awards, for publication of the year. Uh, I did think about illustrating those two awards with another slide, but modesty forbade me from doing so when I discovered what the prize for the Erotic Award actually was, and I'll leave you to Google that uh, later. So on that rather inappropriate note, it now gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Jo Phoenix. Thank you. 
well, well. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Everyone at the back? Brilliant. Okay. Oh, there we go. I'm going to go ahead and start um, fairly promptly without actually telling you all that I feel like crying after that introduction. Thank you. Um, before I want to start, I want to thank the Open University for giving me this opportunity. As Ian said, I turned down previous opportunities, um, and I can't think of a better place to be giving an inaugural lecture than a place that I feel so at home with. Um, but before I start, I also want to make a special note of someone who can't be here today, Professor Pat Carlin. She's been my PhD supervisor, academic manager, mentor, and always a close and loyal friend. Her influence is written all over this presentation for those of you who know her work. This lecture is unashamedly about ideas rather than facts and figures. It is about the ideas that frame how we respond to youth, uh, youth crime rather than about how to reduce it. The first part of the lecture gives a, an historical overview of youth justice. The second part analyzes the circularity of the debates about youth justice reform in relation to ideas about welfare, age, justice, and risk. The final part presents what I call a community-oriented justice, which I see as a way out of the circularity of the debates that we've got into. Please keep these three questions in mind as we go through. For what I'm going to argue is that we ought to get rid of the youth justice system altogether, controversial perhaps, but follow me as we go through that age ought to be considered alongside, not above, other issues like class, sex, and race, but not by formal criminal courts, by community courts made up of lay members operating within the law of the land with the power to hold local authorities, local services, and central government to account for the part it plays in generating the law breaking of youths and adults, as well as the other criminogenic features of the local community such as, for instance, the over-policing of particular constituencies of people like young black men, or indeed the under-protecting of other constituencies like uh, ex se sexually exploited girls and women. But before we can do all of this, I want to just problematize or make a little bit more complicated two ideas than they would ordinarily seem, the idea of crime and the idea of justice. So, hands up everyone who thinks they are a criminal. Okay, that's a, that's a fair few, all right. Okay, hands up, or in fact stand up, if you have persistently broken the law. Okay, we got a few, we got a few, fantastic. All right, sit down everyone. Now for those of you who have not stood up, or raised your hands, I want to ask you a few questions. Have you ever charged your phone whilst at work? Hands up. It's a crime called abstracting electricity. <laughs> Have you taken stationery, pens, pencils, paper, or in fact, printer ink cartridges from your place of work? Theft. <laughs> Have you broken the speed limit? Hands up. That's a crime. Have you made an insurance claim on the basis of accidental damage to one of your belongings when in fact you damaged that thing on purpose? Okay. Oh, we've got a few hands. <laughs> we have one hand. <laughs> All right. Have you taken illegal drugs? Don't, don't put your hands up. <laughs> All right. This is an entertaining way to make three very important points that form part of the domain assumptions for most academic criminologists. The first point, crime is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. We all do it. Criminals aren't out there. They aren't special people who have special reasons for committing crime. Most crime is rational and contextual. The second point, crime is also politically and socially constructed who and what gets seen as the sort of social problem to which law, policing, and punishment become the apposite solution is always a matter of politics and social norms. Third, justice, likewise, is the end product of a series of decisions, negotiations, 
social, political, and economic processes. Take, for instance, child sexual exploitation. In the space of my own career, the problem of young girls being involved in the commercial exchange of sex for money has gone from being seen as a problem of prostitution, with the solution being to arrest the girls, um, to being seen as a special type of prostitution-related problem, with the girls being seen as victims of exploitation and they being used as witnesses in the prosecution of others, to being seen as a type of sexual predation all of its own with the solution being to police toxic max masculinity, I knew I was gonna fumble on that word, toxic masculinity in the form of gangs, to being seen now as just one of the many different types of child sexual abuse, with the solution being offered uh, on offer as guidance and advice to all girls and boys about sexual well-being. That's in the space of my career. As you can see, the object of policing has changed, what comes before the courts has changed. Who gets punished has changed. However, many of the empirical realities facing working class girls, particularly those growing up in care, have not. So in short, justice is the end product of social and political decisions, particularly how we categorize particular types of problems. Everyone with me so far? Brilliant. Okay, so the first part, we're gonna do a little bit of history. Some of this may be familiar to some of you in the room. All right, let's remind ourselves where ideas about youth crime and youth justice, I'm emphasizing youth on purpose here, come from. In Britain, they were formed in the context of industrialization and urbanization and the massive social changes and social problems that these brought. Specifically, our ideas were formed following the Child Labor Acts. For those who don't know, those were the acts that kicked the children out of the factories and mines. And the subsequent unintended consequence of those acts, which was the massive youth vagrancy and poverty that they created. Bearing in mind, those acts took place before the Education Acts. So the kids were kicked out of work, had nowhere to go but the streets. So as Charles Dickens unforgettably portrayed in the different prospects of Oliver Twist and the Artful Dodger, and as these pictures show, this created two very different sorts of childhood experience. At the same time, we also saw the formation of modern police constabularies and policing, along with new practices of recording crime in the form of criminal statistics. As the police started uh, policing working class street kids, funnily enough, the recorded crime statistics demonstrated a rising problem with child crime, youth crime. So it's against this backdrop and the way that childhood was so fundamentally different along class lines that attempts to deal with the newly discovered problem of child crime, I'm not going to do rabbit ears for the entire lecture, I promise, um, was created. Now arguably then, youth justice has, since its inception, been an attempt to deal with, oh, the rabbit ears came back, to deal with problematic working class young people who exist out with the disciplines and norms of family, education, and work. But there is a problem with what I've just said. Um, you may have spotted it. What I've just said implies that age doesn't matter, that youth crime and justice is just an artifice of history a social construct that operates to police the working classes. Yet age obviously does matter. Um, our legal system is based on the Aristotelian principle of treating like things alike. So when assessing individual degrees of blameworthiness, culpability, and responsibility for criminal acts, we have to conclude that adults and children are not alike. This is, simple, this is simply a byproduct of the fact that human beings have a long development period. Thus, in the ideal world, children and young people ought not to be held fully responsible for violation of criminal laws until they are deemed to be fully developed. And again, in the ideal world, the state must act in a benevolent fashion so as to ensure the best interests of the child who offends norms and laws. But in the real world, we see huge variations in the age of criminal responsibility. If we look across these, as you can see here, it really becomes very difficult to disagree with those who argue that at 10 years old, 
England presently punishes young people at too young an age. And in the real world, what does it actually mean to say that the state will act in a benevolent fashion and in the best interests of the child? Well, history gives us a sense. It also gives us an insight into where and why debates about youth justice reform tend to revolve around a series of unresolvably contradictory ideas. So, although uh, what I present here looks like a progression over time, it's important to stress that these ideas never really go away. They simply circulate in the soup of ideas about what we will do um, and find favor at particular moments, are harnessed by practitioners, politicians, and academics at different moments in history to different effect. So in response to the sort of problems that first gave rise to the idea that youth crime and youth justice were somehow separate from adult crime and justice, the main theory that was that impoverished social and economic circumstances in which young working class children were being raised corrupted their childhood innocence did not provide the sufficient moral, ethical, or social foundation to assure their adherence to the disciplines of family, employment, and reputability. So destitution and poverty of the Victorian time period in the early 20th centuries were seen as creating ethically deprived, depraved, socially deprived, and morally corrupt young lawbreakers. In the middle 20th century, though, more emphasis was put on how constrained social and economic circumstances created poor parenting and pathological working class families, which in turn produced troubled, troublesome, and needy adolescents. Each of these ideas found expression in a variety of welfare-oriented justice interventions that were instituted, from the reformatory schools designed to reform the deprived and depraved, to the approved schools presided over by a cater of professionals who all existed in order that the various psychological and social needs of the disturbed, needy young people could be addressed. But all that began to change in the 1970s when the, crime, when the question of crime and justice, especially youth crime, was politicized in a way that had not been witnessed before. Many of us will remember this part of the history. Um, in 1979, Thatcher positioned the rule of law as inseparable from the conservative radical right position that blamed what they saw as the decay and disintegration of a moral and ordered society on labor. Riding on a wave of popular authoritarianism with a strong emphasis on a punitive response to crime, young lawbreakers were seen less as needy and more as criminal. Once elected, the state response to youth crime split in two. On the grounds of saving money, young people whose misdeeds were low level were simply diverted out of the juvenile justice system as it was. And on the grounds of a punitive response, a rising number of young people also found themselves incarcerated. But 1993 was an absolute watershed year. The shocking case of the murder of James Bulger by Thompson and Venables called into, collect, uh, called into question our collective understandings of the innocence of childhood and attitudes began to harden. That same year, the then Prime Minister, John Major, declaimed of youth crime that, quote, society needs to condemn a little more and understand a little less. This was met by Labour's own tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime. As the decade unfolded, uh, the media focused on stories about feral, out of control, persistent young lawbreakers who were given monikers like rat boy, boomerang boy, spider boy, blip boy. Yep. All of these ideas fed three very simple ideas. One, that there was no point trying to stop youth crime, that what we needed was a new way simply to manage the problem. Two, that the cost of the system was spiraling out of control. And three, that the real cause of youth crime was the faulty risk reasoning of some young people. And the solution seemed simple enough, a more justice-oriented actuarial youth justice system. This came in the form of the Crime and Disorder Act in 1998. 
This act made it routine to criminalize children 10 years old and upward by getting rid of something called Dolly Inca Packs, which in effect had previously set the age of criminal responsibility at 14. It also introduced ASBOs, established the Youth Justice Board, youth offending teams, and a host of other important changes. Now importantly, it also made the primary aim of the new youth justice system to prevent children and young people offending by ensuring that the risk factors, which were seen as driving their law breaking, were reduced, including their own faulty risk reasoning. As the years went on, the Crime and Disorder Act led to what Barry Goldson called an industrial scale expansion of youth justice, whereby younger and younger young people were pulled into the system and more and more were incarcerated. At one time, we had the dubious pleasure of being the country in Europe that incarcerated the most number of children and young people. This expansion, coupled with the profound social and economic changes, have led, arguably, to a new set of ideas about the cause of crime. Over the course of the 21st century, we have seen rises in youth unemployment and the destruction of what little was left of welfare entitlements to the young. And we've also seen the normalization of the highly precarious economic and social situation that marks the lives of so many young working class and black and ethnic minority young people today. In other words, we've seen poor quality schooling and education, few jobs, few grants, few meaningful programs, little or no prospects for independent living, and a limited sense of the future, as well as political marginalization. Quite a depressing picture, really. Arguably, these are the very conditions that provide the context for youthful lawbreaking. And let's just remember that as reported last year by the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, the immiseration of young people in England and Wales is not by chance. It was produced, it is by design, by a, quote, punitive and often callous government and the end result of a social engineering uh, program referred to as austerity politics. So over the same period, though, the way that young people in conflict with the law have been treated has raised concerns nationally and internationally. Not only has the, United, the UNCRC reports continued to raise questions about the welfare rights of young offenders and condemn England's reliance on incarcerating young people, our own HM Inspectorate of Prisons reported in February 2017 that there was not a single youth offending institute or secure training center in England and Wales which was deemed safe to hold children. At the same time, develop developments in neuroscience dovetailed with these concerns to raise profound questions about both the risk factor prevention paradigm, which I'll talk to you about in a second, and current practices in youth justice. The logic goes like this. You may not know this neuroscience, so follow me for a second. I'll make it really easy for you. There is a part of your brain called the amygdala. Now, the amygdala supposedly controls impulsivity in human beings, yet there is mounting evidence that the amygdala is not fully developed until around the age of 26 years old. 26, not 10, 26. So that, fault, so that one could argue, faulty risk reasoning may well be biological in origin. And if so, then seeing children as criminal and holding them to criminal account for their deviance seems far from just. What's being suggested in these new critiques of what's happening is that youthful law-breaking is, in fact, a crisis in youth transition. You know? That youth itself is a transition from biological, physical, social immaturity of childhood to the competence and capacity of adulthood. The subtext this time, unlike the earlier subtext of deprived and depraved of Victorian times, is this, that there is a normal transition. That the economy or society will provide enough of the right type of jobs to enable all young people to transition, even though blatantly this is not the case in the real world and that law-breaking and deviance signify a significant threat. Everyone with me? That was a lot of history. So in the next section, I want to show how contemporary debates about reforming youth justice end up in a set of circular, unresolvable critiques and debates 
between opposing approaches to stopping the deviant young person becoming a deviant adult. First approach. This is all a bit abstract, guys. So uh, I'll pause every now and then, meaningfully. OK, the first approach. Uh, we're going to call this the welfare, well-being oriented approach. This approach uh, has a main assumption that delinquents and lawbreaking are products of adverse social, economic, familial, psychological, and environmental factors. This approach favors treatment to be determined by an individual's neediness, if you like, and sentences ought to be individualized and flexible and shaped by the best interests of the child, not necessarily in accordance with standardized rules. In practice, this approach led to indeterminate sentencing in the past, social work interventions, which were often about incarceration, that left young people and parents without legal recourse or challenge, like the right to appeal. Now, you may want to just remember the image from the timeline. You remember the uh, clockwork orange image that was up there? Right, that was of something called the Ludovico technique from Clockwork Orange. The novel was Anthony Burgess's early justice-oriented critique of a welfare model of intervention. The question Burgess raised was whether, in the name of justice, the state has the right to suspend a person's or family's rights to due process and intervene into the very psyches of individuals. Now, against this, we see the justice or rights-oriented approach. The main assumption here is that lawbreaking is a result of choice and opportunity. And the main principles framing the response are proportionality, accountability, determinancy of sentencing, equity, and protection through due of rights through due process. Now, this, the debate between these two sides, has been the most long-running and circular debates within youth justice. The justice approach has raised questions about the justness of indeterminate sentences and the social work interventions that I mentioned earlier. Yet, on the other hand, proponents of several different welfare models hold the view that adult society has a moral obligation to ensure that the primary concern of youth justice should be to promote young people's welfare needs and in so doing critique the justice-based model on the grounds that such models are philosophically problematic they introduce the idea that retributive justice, a just measure of pain, is appropriate uh, with young people. And that uh, this approach tends to abrogate the state's responsibility and leave the welfare needs of the child unaddressed. So two completely polar views that cannot be reconciled. <coughs> Third approach. Actuarial justice, now a word for those of you who may never have heard the term actuarial or think you've heard it but not sure where you've heard it from. It actually comes from the idea of actuarial science, which is the discipline that applies mathematical and statistical models to assess risk in insurance, for instance, and finance. The main assumption behind this approach is that lawbreaking is rational, driven by the accumulation of risk factors, and caused by faulty assessment of risks and benefits on the part of the individual. And the main principles framing the response is the reduction of risk factors, the management of crime, and preventative sentencing. Now, to quote one of the originators of this thing called the risk factor prevention paradigm, which sits underneath this, a man called David Farrington, the task is, quote, to identify the key risk factors for offending and implement prevention methods designed to counteract them, end quote. Such an approach can, quote, be used not only to identify variables to be targeted, but also to identify persons to be targeted in an intervention program, end quote. Typically, these are things such as, quote, low intelligence, low empathy, impulsiveness, family problems, abuse and neglect, um, Target, and these are uh, targeted for intensive work with problem children and their families. In practice, typically, the targets are poor, black and minority ethnic young men, children from working class families, single parent families, children with educational issues. In other words, the same old, same old. Right. Now, it's worth noting that preventative sentencing and justice are also philosophically problematic uh, particularly for children, 
because it's based on an assessment of future behavior rather than punishment or treatment for past behavior. Everyone still with me? Have I put anyone to sleep yet? No, doesn't look like it. Okay, the fourth approach is not so much an approach as an attempt to reinvigorate aspects of both the welfare and the justice approach in a very 21st century way. I'm calling this a child-friendly approach. The fact that that little pie piece is sitting outside the circle is on purpose. It wasn't an accident. It's because this approach hasn't actually been fully implemented per se. It's more of a critique of where we're at. Um, but the main assumption is that lawbreaking is developmental and or a sign of a troubled transition. It's sitting outside the pie chart, as I said, because it hasn't really been put fully into practice. The principles do, however, underlie um, some of the Welsh child first offenders second approach. Um, there's also something called the positive futures approach. But in this model, what we see is children and young people as rights bearers, right? the bearers of rights, uh, due to their legally protected status underneath the UNCRC, that's the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And young lawbreakers here are seen as needing uh, legal protections from the state, which is a very different position. Uh, now, proponents of various welfare well-being models suggest that contemporary practices of youth justice actively damage children and young people and damage their well-being and thus their transition to adulthood. All right. This is a way of summarizing it up. And what I've tried to indicate is that the concentration on how to stop our concentration, on how to stop young lawbreakers becoming adult lawbreakers has ended up in the, the circularity of debate between unresolvably contradictory positions. And this is just an attempt to graphically demonstrate that. Um, but we can uh, verbally demonstrate it by saying welfare models question actuarial models for jeopardizing a young person's transition to adulthood. They also question the use of retributive or punitive, uh, preventative punishments which ignore the development needs of a young person and thereby adult or eight youth justice. And contemporary versions of youth justice, of justice models see actuarial and some forms of welfare as actively damaging and causing harm to the young person, and so on, and so on, and so on. It just keeps going round and round and round. Right, I want to have another look at this, but this time, instead of rehearsing the more or less standard debates, right, I've just summarized them, I want to just draw your attention to a very specific thing within these debates. Um, interestingly, all youth justice models do actually recognize a young person's social and economic context. All of them do. And how this might relate to their own, to their law breaking. But in their own ways, each one focuses almost entirely on how to change the young person. This is a problem because the emphasis on the individual serves to exclude or deprioritize the well-known links between criminal and social justice, between structural social inequalities and social discrimination and the administration of criminal justice, and indeed criminalization, a word we'll come back to. Now, rather than go through each one of these in turn, I want to think about the actuarial model in just a tiny bit of detail, um, for it tells us something quite interesting. Welfare and child-friendly and justice rights models critique the actuarial model for ignoring the social context and for focusing almost entirely on it, getting the young person to change their less than law-abiding behavior through a series of programs of interventions like anger management, victim awareness programs, and so on. Yet the risk factor prevention paradigm is framed loosely within an epidemiological approach. One could argue that had it been properly implemented, it might have provided a potent way of addressing the links between social inequalities and criminal justice. I'm going to borrow a line of argument from two very promising scholars in the US, Tim Goddard and Randy Myers. Let's think a little bit about Zika, the Zika virus here for a second. Uh, in the public health epidemiological approach, individuals were asked to apply mosquito repellent. This is like the anger management 
programs that young offenders are given, uh, young lawbreakers are given. But a truly public health or epidemiological approach to Zika also sprayed the wetlands that generated the mosquitoes um, that would bite. Now, this would be the equivalent of us addressing the social inequalities that are experienced by young people. But instead, these opportunities were lost in the drive to hold the individual young person accountable and responsible. So before moving on to the final part of the presentation, let's remind ourselves why it's important to think about those failed opportunities to address social inequality. Hands up, those of you who committed a crime when you were a youth. Right, everyone just look around the room for a second. We got pretty much 90%, I'd say. Oh, I need to put my hand up. Um, hands up, those of you who got arrested. We have less than a handful, less than a handful. Okay. Now that quick exercise, as fun as it is, also points to a very important concept within criminology. That's the concept of criminalization, i.e. coming to the attention of the criminal justice system. Most of us commit crime. Many of us committed crime as youngsters. Few of us come to the attention of the criminal justice system. Now what we know from nearly two centuries of research into youth crime, as mentioned at the outside, uh, outset of the lecture, is a very high correlation between social inequalities, disadvantage, discrimination, and criminalization. Very high correlation. But sadly, we can't prove it through statistics because the government doesn't routinely record the class position of those that come before the youth courts. Instead, we have to see that correlation through the use of a series of proxy measures. So the sort of patterns that we see Young people in the youth justice system tend to come from areas of above average levels of unemployment and where there is poor access to public services. There are a disproportionate number of looked after children in the youth justice system, approximately five times too many. In 2014 to 2016, 61 percent of those in, youth, uh, those in the youth justice system were not engaging in education. 45% had substance misuse issues, 30% had mental health issues. And we need to also remember that there are high correlations between economic adversity, family struggles, poor housing, and higher levels of ill health. And finally, in the UK longitudinal studies have confirmed what us criminologists have been saying for a very long time. The single most significant predictor of future offending is contact with the youth justice system, plain and simple. Now, just to underscore that, a few stats. I tried to stay away from numbers. I'm quite proud of the fact that most of the uh, articles and books I've written don't have numbers in them, um, but I've given you a few here. In 2007, around 115,000 young people came into the youth justice system for the first time. Just 115,000, right? By 2017, it was only 14,000, right? That's a decline of over 86%, a massive decline uh, in the numbers of young people coming into the youth justice system. Yet, as this shows, the proportion of black and ethnic minority uh, young people in the youth justice system is going up. So we can begin to see some of these inequalities and discriminations just through these. Now, this racialization is ev evident elsewhere. Other Anglophone countries display same or similar trends. In 2017 and 18, every single young person who was incarcerated in the Northern Territories of Australia was Aboriginal. Every single young person. And those stats show the same in America. They show a very clear and much higher correlations between class, race, and criminalization. Okay, still with me? Have I depressed you? <laughs> Good. Right, let's see how we can get out of this, right? Because I don't, I, don't, I don't know about you, I don't like being depressed. I'm actually quite a cheery person, believe it or not. So how do we escape this endless circularity of age-related justice issues? How can we link social and criminal justice in what we do? Now I hope what's come out for you so far 
is that when we give precedence to considerations of age difference in debate about what to do with young people who are in trouble with the law, we end up in that circularity. It's, it's a necessary thing because the problematic becomes how do we stop young people who are uh, breaking the law from becoming adults breaking the law. And yet, even within some of the models that we've outlined earlier, it is possible to imagine a response that emphasizes the role of social disadvantage, as well as how a variety of social discriminations around class, race, gender, sex, religion, and so on, shape the administration of justice. Now, one way to do this, I want to suggest to you, is something that I'm calling community-oriented justice. Community-oriented justice sees young people and adults who are suspected or found guilty as part of the community in which they live, rather than merely or only a set of walking risk factors transitioning to a law-abiding adulthood. But before I tell you what community-oriented justice is, I want to tell you what it is not. It is not controlling crime via community policing. It is not controlling crime by community courts, although I'm going to call them community courts in a second, so it's a little bit confusing there. Um, it's not restorative justice, and it's not reparative justice panels. All of these forms of justice require the individual to repair the damage that they have committed to the community. So again, it places the onus back on the individual. Nor are they problem-solving, specialist diversionary courts, which are an, a, an alternative to formal adjudication, even though these have been established to deal with complex and profound welfare-related problems. Now, a community-oriented justice has uh, the, this main assumption, that adults and young people who come to the attention of criminal justice share more in common than separates them. And the emphasis of uh, my suggestion for a community-oriented justice needs to be on ameliorating the effects of social injustice. What would this look like? These are a new form of community courts. Uh, these community courts are lay people, comprised of lay people, operating within the laws of the land. They are empowered to develop greater understanding and evidence of the criminogenic features of their communities. For those who don't know that term, it means the things that produce crime, such as the over-policing of black and ethnic minority young people, the lack of public leisure facilities for young people. They would need to analyze data and trends, including the identification of areas producing disproportionate numbers of young lawbreakers, and the socioeconomic drivers of any of these, of a growth in any of these. They would use this understanding to hold local authorities, police constabularies, and through them central government accountable for their abrogation and their duties to tackle the sources of youthful and adult crime in the area. And they could take part in political discussions at the local authority level about how to resolve some of the problems that young people face, such as youth unemployment, the lack of access to housing, um, the lack of further education or vocational training without burdening young people with debt. Now, age here is treated as just one of the many salient factors that courts take account of, along with class, race, sex, and gender, when addressing the criminogenic features of the community. So the focus is the community. It's not the individual. Now, the possibilities are almost limitless. Community courts could order local police constabularies to address the manner in which they over-police, arrest, and charge particular constituencies of individuals or particular types of people. They could order local authorities to address the sources of fear and insecurity that drive other groups of young people to carry knives, for instance, or through concerted action to address the economic drivers that make knife and drug crime a rational and reasonable response to often extreme economic precarity. Or local authorities could create more usable, safe, friendly, and free public spaces and leisure facilities for young people. In other words, these things could offer entirely novel experimentation with a totally different way of understanding and addressing the issues inherent in the complexity of young people's transition to adulthood as well as in adult lives. 
As I said at the beginning of the lecture, it was all about ideas. It's not about what can be done to reduce law-breaking of young people or how to reform youth justice. The purpose was simply to open a space to conceive of a form of justice that does not take age differentiation and the idea of young people's transitions to adulthood as the overriding concerns determining our official response. The lecture was also utterly utopian uh, in its vision for an alternative form of justice. I make no apologies for this, as I believe it is not possible to address issues of social justice without recourse to blue skies, thinking and visions. And let's face it, if we were all tied to imagining only what was realistic and grounded in the realities of the present, I dare say that such a thing as an open university would not exist. Now, before I hand over the podium, before I finish, I just want to thank a few people. Sadly, no one from... <laughs> Why does it always happen at this point? Right, sadly, no one from my family of origin could make it here tonight. Although I'm sorry about that, I am, however, delighted that my family of choice could make it here tonight. This is the rabble in the front row, for those of you who don't know. Over the years, all of you, in your various ways, have helped me through the hard times and celebrated my achievements with bottles of champagne, lots of bottles of champagne, late night talks around various campfires, or sitting, sipping some cocktail or other at one or other festivals and camps that have punctuated our summers together. I want to mention one person in particular, Ruby, in the front row. She's still young and yet to transition, although her future is very promising. She has been nominated as one of the brightest young people in Wales, Ruby, if my story has anything to say, it's that your future is limited only by your imagination. Imagine big and push hard because everything is possible. Finally, I want to thank my partner, PJ Buchanan. She has had a tremendous influence on my life and yet how she shaped my work seldom gets acknowledged. She has spent our lifetime encouraging me to chase my dreams and flights of fancy whether that was a readership at Durham, wearing pink fairy wings at a festival. <laughs> that won't happen again. <laughs> or indeed, chasing my dreams to come work here at the Open University. What few people know is she wakes up every morning to my latest thesis, <laughs> and she listens patiently. PJ, I adore you, and I thank you from the bottom of my heart. I think it's that time of the evening when we move to the Q&A Q &A session. Yeah, we're good at doing the um, <laughs> little and large double act. <laughs> um, so obviously if you've got thoughts, questions, or just comments and observations, um, let, let's, let's hear them. Joe, do you want to yeah. join us over at the... Okay, so shall we start off in the room? Who, who have we got in the room? Right in the far back corner. So, so do you just want to wait for a mic just to come up? I think, I'm, I think I'm going to start by giving some observations, right? One of the recurring themes I noticed throughout this lecture, the bit that I was able to, able to get here for, is opportunity is a major factor for basically thing, basic criminalisation and whatnot. And I think it's one point where I would say is, for me personally, the Open University has played a major part in giving me, giving me prospects I might not otherwise have. So I think actually in giving people hope, the Open University is a key example of how you can give people that. Oh, that's a nice <laughs> observation. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello, Francis Chetwind. Um, I am actually an um, adult and family magistrate, but not a youth magistrate uh, in Cornwall and see social injustice in the courtroom every time we go in there. Um, 
you know, from the um, businessman with his QC trying to avoid a driving ban compared to the pregnant single mother with two children also trying to avoid a driving ban and defending herself. Mm. So I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, uh, I'm, I wasn't quite so sure about all of your utopian <laughs> ideas. Um, a lay court, um, you know, being a lay magistrate, you need the professionals in the courtroom to make sure you actually stick to the law mm. and, and produce legal um, responses. But I wondered if you could say which one thing you would do moving towards your utopia to help uh, the youth justice system uh, move in the right direction. Mm. That's a really good question, because um, there's always got to be steps, hasn't there, to utopia? Um, and the first step might be a little bit more realistic than the end product that I was trying to envisage. And I think one of the things, if we could create a mechanism or a means, or even authorize, give power to perhaps a magistrate's court, probably have to be outside, to actually do the equivalent of, do you remember the crime audits of the 1990s? So for those of you who don't know, crime audits of the 1990s, they came off the back of the Crime and Disorder Act. Uh, local police constabularies were meant to understand the issues of crime and disorder in their local community. Um, and there, from that, there would be a community safety uh, plan. Um, now, you could use exactly those same techniques uh, of kind of auditing a local community for what the problems are, where the problems are. But instead of focusing on like individual senses of security, you actually use, as I indicated uh, at the very end, you use some of the data that you can generate about where policing is most concentrated, where people are experiencing most of those difficulties, and actually use that to begin to generate a conversation at the local political level about how to engage and how to change some of those problems. Because one of the problems that you've got as a magistrate, I mean, you'll know this much more than I do, uh, but one of the challenges that I see for magistrates is you see those social inequalities, and yet what can you do about them? And where, do, where does all the knowledge that you have go? I mean, literally, it goes nowhere except home with you, doesn't it? <coughs> yeah. So somehow we've got to take the knowledge that's happening, and indeed, you know, I can't imagine that anybody gets involved in criminal justice work for wrong reasons. So we have to somehow harness that energy to create a very different sort of discussion about who and what needs to be held accountable. Um, does that, I mean, it's good. utopian, but. <laughs> sounds good. So let's take one more in the room and then we'll, we'll move to an online one. That's Thank Steve. you very much, Joe. Uh, sorry, Steve Toombs, I'm a colleague of, uh, of Joe's here at the Open University. Um, that was lovely, Joe, although I want to say that I don't think at the end you're utopian enough, actually, and I make two observations. Uh, one is that Stuart Hall and his colleague, Stuart Hall, formerly of this parish, um, in Policing the Crisis in 1978, says something like that, paraphrase, we only understand who a society criminalises when we understand who it doesn't criminalise. Yes, so as well as your quasi-abolitionistic uh, tendencies towards the end, <laughs> I'd also argue that, that they're furthered by maintaining as part of our vision abolishing the corporation and abolishing the state. I think they go hand in hand yeah. with some of your utopian uh, 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 visions at the very end. And the second thing to say, which is kind of related, is that where on a local level, those kind of what you just alluded to, which I think of as harm audits, where local communities are asked to audit harms, which blight their lives on a daily basis and thwart their life opportunities, they almost never refer to the kinds of things which are criminalised in the society. Right. They almost never refer to the incivilities which we've criminalised under the term anti-social behaviour orders. Mm. They, of course, refer to the state of the natural environment, the lack of access to, 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 uh, 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 to hospitals, to healthcare, to, to job opportunities, and all of those kinds of things. Mm. So I'd just say, in, in those two respects, I mean, I think they're linked, and I think the, your, your utopianism could be extended even further. Yeah. But thank you very much yeah. for that. No, you're welcome. You're welcome. When you, uh, when you held your hand up, I was quaking. <laughs> Where's that going to go? Where's that going to go? I think one of the things just to underline, though, I mean, I, I agree. You could go as far as, as you want with this because, as I say, the, the, the opportunities are almost limitless or the ideas are almost limitless. However, where it starts is whether we have a youth justice system or not. So, in fact, one of the things I was trying to just disturb, if you like, and just split off is the idea that we have to treat young people separately in this new world. Um, so, yeah, but totally agree.
Okay, thanks, Steve. This is a question that ca came in by email before the lecture, actually. And it's Dear Joe, is it right that children or those under 18 years in the Crown Courts having committed a serious offence should be treated as though they were adults and tried accordingly? Or should children be protected from the harm this could potentially cause? Children are constantly developing, uh, developing emotionally, physically, and of course psychologically, and therefore punishments should be carefully thought through so as to protect children while at the same time keeping them free from further offending. I myself was taken through the criminal courts for a serious offence and was sent to a young offenders institution. Although I never re-offended, it has caused significant harm both psychologically and emotionally as I now have mental health problems and struggle in my ability to engage socially. What, a very, Chandler, yeah. what a very well worded and thoughtful question and also one that contains the exact circularity that I was outlining. Um, it contains it all within one person's experience. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to answer it beyond saying yes. It is wrong. Yeah. Okay, let's go back to the room. I think I saw a couple of hands over here. Colleague at the front. Thank you. Um, Jason Moore. Um, I'd just like to ask a question about your utopian future. <laughs> if, if we're in this utopian future, it seems over the last two decades at least, we have ministers coming into uh, various positions within the justice system who come in with particular ideas. Um, they you know, come in like a wrecking ball and uh, uh, impose their particular ideas about what they want justice to be. And then, especially in the last five years, six months later, they're gone. Um, in your utopian future, would ministers have much role <laughs> in the governance or in the, um, um, uh, the kind of authoritative structure of these lay positions? Or would it be completely removed? Um, neither removed, field? neither removed, nor have authority. So this is the one bit, Steve and I are going to have to have a discussion about this much later, but this is the one bit that I would say I perhaps wasn't as utopian enough because I would keep the government there, but I'd have the um, systems of accountability inverted, right? So it would be the lay courts through the, the lay courts would hold local authorities to account through them, central government to account. So the discussions would be coming up from the ground. Um, so we would have governments and... <coughs> Um, ministers who were truly servants of the public rather than masters determining other people's um, fates and futures. Okay. I mean, it is almost impossible, but hey, you know, yeah. we can dream the impossible. Really good answer. We've got time for maybe two more. So I think there was somebody at the back, uh, right? And then have we got another online one or one, one at the front? Maybe another online one as well then. Okay, so three more questions. Hi there, my name's Vanessa. Um, I actually work for a charity, so um, I see a lot of this with young people on our project. Um, one of them set a small fire in a, a back garden a long time ago and worries this will prevent her from getting a job in the future. A lot of the work we do around supporting young people and changing their life trajectory is around mentoring. Mm. So I wondered what your thoughts are. Obviously, utopias are, you know, maybe, <laughs> but what about now, <laughs> what we're doing now and yeah. your thoughts on mentoring? I mean, I was, having, I was having a conversation at lunchtime. Um, I think it was lunchtime today. I think we were having a conversation about this. That one of the challenges that you've got, particularly with kids who are growing up in, in, in care or who are coming from really challenging family circumstances, is that they almost never get the chance to make mistakes without severe consequence. Um, and the answer comes in two parts, so forgive me. The first part is they don't get a chance to make mistakes without consequence. I sat in a youth court once for six months watching the business. There was a 13-year-old and a 14-year-old boy who ended up in a secure training center because they had drunk a skin full of cider and started kicking the fence of the local authority children's home that they lived in. Uh, and the people in the children's home rang the police. And they got arrested for criminal damage. Now, of course, if that was you or me, and it was our kid who did that. You know, they may get a clip around the air. They may get, you know, sentenced, not sentenced, you know, kind of 
told to go stay in their bedroom. They may be involved in having to mend the fence. There would be some sort of consequence that was slightly more commensurate. But it would also be generally from an adult or indeed siblings who could help that person understand what was happening and why that was wrong. And I think uh, mentoring has a fantastic role in helping young people understand what can be possible and providing, if you like, role models and, and those kind of responsible uh, relationships. But again, the problem becomes focusing on getting the individual to change. And even today on Radio 4, I don't know how many of you listen to Radio 4 in the morning, there was a, a short clip about doctors over-prescribing antidepressants uh, for poverty, basically. So, you know, we, we come to this, this kind of backwards and forwards. Mentoring is great, but it's only one tiny part of a much bigger problem, as no doubt you well know from your own experiences. Okay, thanks, Joe. I think we've got time for just two more, so maybe one online and then one in, one in the room. Thank you, Joe. Um, lots of really warm feedback coming in from Facebook, yeah. so I just want to let you know that was, that was brilliant. Thank you. Um, so just one question from Michelle, who's asking, is it the parents or the young adults who are at fault, or is it the society that we live in? Um, <laughs> is there anyone in the room who might be able to answer that on my behalf? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a combination of everything, isn't it, really? However, I would say that most of us commit crime. <laughs> most of us commit crime. In fact, I think every, nearly everybody raised their hands. So if we talk about just the parents being wrong, then we've all come from really bad families. Um, so it is, in large part, the social context in which we live. Crime, law-breaking is rational. Um, yeah, thanks. Um. I think my questions have might probably been answered already. But yeah. it was just about uh, looked after children. Yeah. Uh, because they're... Um, everything about looked after children is below the bar, yeah. no matter what way you measure it. <coughs> and regardless of how many children who are looked after who achieve and achieve great success, so many more yeah. are, do not succeed. So in your utopia, would you have a special <laughs> place for looked after oh. children? Have you and I, you know, because their need is so huge, mm -hmm. even with BME or whatever way you, whatever you want to measure things with, looked after children, uh, their measures are just worse. Is there anything you do differently with them? Uh, Orla, that, that's a question that has literally um, been in my mind since I first started doing research with child sexual exploitation. Because of course what you have with looked after children is where the main institution in our society fails, the family fails. And how do we replicate something like a family? Um, Okay, we can have state care, there's no two ways about it, but uh, that state care has to be held to account to a level that, uh, sadly, it is not currently funded, um, and governments aren't held to account to make sure that they provide what is necessary for the professionals to do the job that they need to do for the kids. So in my utopia, again, if we see you know, six times as many kids in care ending up in the youth justice system in you know, one particular area of Bristol, for instance, then those lay community courts need to be involved in a very big discussion with the local authority and through them central government about funding. So it's, it's, a, it's a kind of long-term build-up, you know, and it can't, you know, this utopian vision cannot be confined just to law-breaking. It's got to go way wider than that. Come the revolution. <laughs> okay, thank you, Joe. Okay, well, thank you, Joe, for a really excellent lecture and um, a, a great uh, session afterwards. I think the fact there was a lot of warm fa Facebook feedback said it all, really. A, re a really, really good session. So let's give Joe another a round of applause. <laughs>